Well, this morning we're looking at the next portion of uh, Luke's gospel, and here is uh, the event that Luke records that essentially takes place in Caesarea Philippi, and this is where Jesus uh, is asking his disciples, uh, who do people say that I am, and who do you say that I am, and, and then Jesus, when, when that part of it's clear, tells them what he must do, and then he tells them what they must do in order to follow him. So let me read the text first, and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and go through it. So beginning in verse 18 of Luke chapter 9, And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah. But others, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this part of his word to our hearing. And again, I remind you, this is a very challenging uh, part of scripture, but it applies to us as disciples of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Jesus was going to give up his life, and he says if we were to follow him, we must be willing to do the same. Now again, by way of review, remember after Jesus sent out his uh, disciples to preach in the towns and villages around Galilee, And after he himself had gone out to do the same, he then took them to Bethsaida for rest. Now, we saw last week that they never actually got that rest because when Jesus saw the crowds following, when they realized he was gone, they came after him, he set his own needs aside in order to minister to them. And again, uh, where does Jesus find his refreshment? He finds it, in the first place, in service. But now that he had healed the people and taught them and fed them, and after his disciples had enjoyed their basket of leftovers, remember from five loaves and two fish, he feeds over 5,000 people who were there, 5,000 men besides others that might have been there, and they pick up the 12 extra baskets. Uh, Matthew tells us that he continued north until he came to Caesarea Philippi. By the way, Bethsaida, if you can picture the, the Sea of Galilee, Bethsaida is sort of north and a little bit to the east, and Caesarea Philippi is going up further north. Uh, Luke doesn't tell us this, but Matthew does, that this event takes place in Caesarea Philippi. So he's traveling up in this direction, and here he and his disciples finally get that rest that Jesus wanted them to have. Now, one thing that's interesting to note throughout the Gospels is how Jesus actually rested. You know how he got his rest? You know, he didn't just take a, a vacation, which is kind of interesting. He didn't take two weeks off and go somewhere and, and basically enjoy a, a nice balmy lake or, you know, the, the things that we would normally do. But what Jesus did is he would spend time in prayer. He spent time communing with his father, asking for his help and for the strength that he needed to continue to carry out his work as well as praying for his disciples. That's how Jesus actually rested and how he was refreshed by spending time with his Father. Now, when we find ourselves growing tired and the work that our Lord calls us to do, maybe what we need isn't so much a vacation, but we need an extended time of prayer, time with the Father, time with our Lord Jesus Christ, asking for more of the Spirit's help, that we might have more of his power. You know, that makes all the difference in the world as far as our serving him. You know, Martin Luther realized that. I've used this example over and over, but it it really is an an admonishment to us 
Because we look at his life and we look at the industry that he had and how much the Lord did through him. And I think if we look at all the people the Lord used, we find the same kind of pattern. And that is they spent a lot of time with the Lord in prayer. Martin Luther spent two hours every day in prayer. When was the last time you spent two hours in prayer? When's the last time I did that? And then when Luther had a very busy day, instead of crowding out that two hours of prayer, he would actually find more time to pray. He would pray for three hours, asking for the Lord's help. Now, again, I think this is the secret of their success. The secret of their power is they found strength with the Lord. And we need to ask ourselves, how is our prayer life? Maybe this is the kind of rest that we need rather than the other kind that we usually think about. Now, when Jesus was done praying, uh, I believe that he realized the Father communicated to him it was time to teach his disciples perhaps the next level of their commitment, basically to teach them three things, three things that would change their lives forever. First of all, who he is, and I don't think we should assume the disciples didn't know this, they did. What it is that he had to do, this, I think, was a bit of a revelation, but something Jesus was telling them over and over again. But maybe something else they didn't recognize, what they, as his disciples, must also do, and what we must do as his disciples. This is what we want to consider this morning. Now, first of all, he teaches them who he is. He begins by asking a question. Who do the people say that I am? You know, Jesus is the best teacher, he is the perfect teacher, and he has the best methods of teaching. And the question is a very good place to start when you want to teach somebody something that's very important. Sometimes even the most attentive hearers have a difficult time staying focused during a lecture, which is why we need to be careful during a sermon that we don't kind of you know, wander off, uh, because we don't, we're not having a discussion. This is kind of a one-way uh, conversation. Uh, the best way, I think, to learn is the way that Jesus is, is teaching here, where you get your audience to begin thinking about what it is you want to teach them, and you ask them questions that provoke a good discussion. Discussion is really, I think, the best way to learn. Well, Jesus wanted, you know, to get their minds going. He wanted them to begin thinking, but at the same time, he wanted them also to, to um, he wanted to know, I should say, what it is they had heard about him and what it is that they believed in their own hearts regarding him. Well, their answer was this in verse 19. This is what people think about you. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. But others, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. By the way, you should recognize this because these were the opinions that Luke told us earlier that were circulating among the people and eventually reached the ears of Herod. Okay, this is what Herod heard. Now, some people thought he was John the Baptist who had risen from the dead. This was the view that concerned Herod in particular because he was the one who took John and had him beheaded because he didn't like what John had to say about his relationship with his brother's wife. Matthew tells us that this is also why Herod believed that Jesus was able to do the miraculous things that he was doing because he's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Now, others thought that he was Elijah, Elijah the prophet. Why would they think that? Well, remember what Malachi wrote, the words that close the Old Testament scriptures. Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. The Lord says through Malachi, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Some people believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy. You know, Jesus had not yet told his disciples that that prophecy had already been fulfilled, but Herod had already taken Elijah and cut off his head, okay? Now, what he was talking about, of course, was John the Baptist. Not that John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah, because the Bible tells us it is appointed to men or for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. Okay, you only get one body in life, and it's going to be your body. There is no such thing as reincarnation. But what he meant, or what he will mean when he tells them this, 
is that John the Baptist fulfilled Malachi's prophecy by preaching, well, through, I should say John the Baptist, by preaching with the power of Elijah as the angel prophesied to Zacharias when he was in the temple and told him John the Baptist was going to be born. So, again, no, he, some think you're Elijah, but no, that's really John the Baptist. So really John the Baptist and Elijah really amount to the same thing. Still others saw him as one of the prophets of old, such as Moses or Samuel or Elisha or Isaiah. Why would they think that? Well, because these men could perform these kinds of miracles. They were the great prophets that God had raised up in the Old Covenant. Now, this is what the people were thinking. That's what Jesus wanted them to ask or answer, right? But they're wrong, okay? Popular opinion isn't often right, which is why we always need to examine everything by the word of our Lord. Now, wanting to know if they had bought into these theories, he next asked this question, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Christ of God. And by the way, I, I think we should understand that this was not something unique to Peter. I think the other disciples realized this as well, but he was the first one to speak up. Now, Jesus had not yet told them who he was, but Peter knew. And how did Peter know? Well, we might think he had simply seen enough of what Jesus was doing and saying that he finally figured it out for himself because Jesus was doing what Messiah would do. But many others had seen that and they hadn't figured it out. Well, Jesus actually tells us how he did it in, in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 16, verse 17, he says this, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. Peter, you didn't learn this from man. You didn't learn it from public opinion. You didn't learn it from the other disciples. You learned this from God. And I think this was something that the Lord had revealed to all of his disciples except for one, and that would be, of course, Judas. Now, Jonathan Edwards actually used this verse to, as the basis of his book, Religious Affections, which is a book on how to know that what you're experiencing as a Christian actually is a work of the Holy Spirit. That this passage is telling us how any of us, how anyone who actually comes to know Jesus Christ comes to know him. And it is through this revelation of the Father. This is what, the way that Jonathan Edwards put it. It's through the divine and supernatural light that is immediately imparted to the soul by the Spirit of God. This kind of knowledge that, that Peter had wasn't just, you know, I, now I know that you are the Messiah, but it's more than just simply knowing that. It's seeing something about Jesus that is beautiful, that is his glory. It's seeing who he is in, in all of his beauty and all of his splendor, the beauty of his holiness. It is a sight of the Lord Jesus Christ that draws our hearts out to him, that makes us want him and makes us receive him as our Savior, that makes us want to, of course, follow him. It makes us place our whole hope of heaven upon him, causes us to take him as our Lord and in love surrender to his will. Why is it that these disciples were following Jesus? Well, 11 of them were following him because they loved him, because the Father had revealed to them who he was. The other one was following, following Jesus because he liked to steal money out of the money bag. That was, of course, Judas. Now, in other words, this revelation from the Father that Jesus is talking about here is actually conversion. This is the new birth of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, this is also what it means to be a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we see who Jesus really is and in love, we follow him. Now, I say that because this part of it's very important, especially because of what Jesus is going to tell them next. Next, he's going to tell them what he came into the world to do, and then he's going to tell them what it is they must do to follow him. So secondly, Jesus told them what it was he was going to do. Now that they had become more aware, fully aware that he was the Christ, uh, any perhaps doubts they may have had or suspicions were, were dispelled. 
he warned them that they must not tell anyone about it, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because today we're to tell everybody Jesus is the Christ. Why weren't they to tell everyone? Well, it's because if his enemies knew, they would try to kill him. This is something that Jesus always kept under wraps until the very last of his life when it was revealed and they take him and put him on trial. If they had known earlier, they would have really tried to stop him from what he had yet to do. And Jesus had many things yet to do. He had to finish his work. There were many he still needed to reach with the gospel. They needed to hear him. His disciples were not yet ready to carry on this work by themselves. There was much he still needed to teach them. They needed to learn. And once this was done, then Jesus would willingly lay down his life. He would reveal that he was the Messiah. He says in verse 22 this, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Jesus is telling them, although they didn't quite understand it, they couldn't quite comprehend it for reasons we'll see in just a moment, but this is why Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to suffer for them and for us, to be arrested, to be put on trial, to be condemned. He had to be handed over to the Romans to be mocked, scourged, and crucified. He came in order to suffer the penalty of sin that was due to us to take the curse on himself and to die in our place, not just die on the cross, but suffer hell on the cross, suffer the wrath of God on the cross. He is the Lamb of God who takes away our sins through the sacrifice of himself. Jesus said this is why he's come into the world. But after he died, he had to be raised again on the third day for his and our justification, okay? When Jesus rose again from the dead, when he was raised by the Father, that was the Father's declaration that Jesus was, in fact, who he claimed to be. And he had done what he set out to do. The Father had received his sacrifice on our behalf. Our sins, which put him into the grave, were taken away, and he was alive again, which means that we also will live because our guilt has been taken away. Okay, now this is what Jesus said. This is why the Son of Man has come into the world. I am the Christ, and this is my mission. Now, Luke doesn't record what happens next, as Matthew does, but after Jesus said this, Peter turned to him, and he said this, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Now, why in the world would Peter say that? Well, it's because Peter didn't understand what Jesus came into the world to do. Peter still thought, as the rest of the disciples, that Jesus was not a spiritual Messiah who had come to save us from our sins, but he was a political Messiah who came to deliver Israel from the Romans. The Romans can't kill you, Jesus. You came into the world to kill the Romans, to destroy them, okay? So it doesn't fit his pattern. At the same time, we need to understand that Peter had a little bit of self-interest involved in this. He was thinking about himself. What would happen if, if Jesus was killed? Who's going to lead us? Who's going to take care of us? What about our freedom from the Romans? You were going to deliver us. Jesus, I thought you were going to offer us a place in your kingdom. What about that place? I mean, if you're not going to set up a kingdom, what, what happens to that? Well, you see what was happening here. Peter's self-interest was getting in the way. His selfishness, he was thinking only about himself. And selfishness and self-interest is really the essence of sin, isn't it? It's the definition of sin, doing what pleases us rather than what pleases God. Do you realize the Ten Commandments, God's law, the standard of righteousness and holiness is all about self-sacrifice? It's about love that costs us something for someone else. It's doing what honors God, even if it means I have to suffer for it. Doing good, what's, what, well, what's good for our neighbor, even if it costs us something. So it's not self-interest or self-gain. It's about self-expense for others. Now, Peter's self-interest and his sin, helped along and empowered by the devil, brought this rebuke from Jesus. In verse 23 of Matthew 16, Get behind me, Satan. 
You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Okay, you see the difference here? You weren't thinking about what God wants. You were thinking about what you want, and that's exactly what the devil did. The devil certainly was encouraging this, but his self-interest was just like the devil's. You see, at one moment, Peter was blessed. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because God has revealed this to you. You know, blessed with spiritual insight, and in the very next moment, he falls into a very serious sin. I think this teaches us that we're never more likely to fall into sin than when we think ourselves to be most spiritual. Peter probably thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. You know, when you, when you begin to think that way, a fall is just around the corner. Now, Jesus had to die. That's why he came into the world. And Peter needed to get out of his way. But you know what? Peter actually had to do much more than that. Peter also had to die. Jesus had to die. Peter had to die. So that brings us to our third point. We see what we need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And here's where I need to again give this disclaimer, so to speak. We know that we're saved by grace and not by works. And we cannot understand that, you know, what Jesus says next as what it is we must do in order to earn or to enter into heaven in that sense. But the way we need to see it is this. What he says will be true of us if we have trusted him and will inherit heaven. This is what his grace works in us. Either way, we have to do it. Okay? But the motive is different. The motive, on the one hand, is I do this to earn heaven. That's legalism. And that's the destruction of the gospel. The other is Jesus saves me and he transforms my life. And this is what the result's going to be. I'm going to live this kind of life. And so we do it out of thankfulness for the Lord's mercy and grace. So having told them what he must go through, that he needs to die in order to bring life, he then tells his disciples they have to go through the same thing. And we read this in verses 23 through 26. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus was telling them, I'm going to die, but you also have to die if you are to enter into life. You have to die to yourself. So now tying this together with what we saw earlier of the divine supernatural light, if we have received it, if the Spirit of God has opened our eyes to see the beauty and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we have trusted Him, if we have given ourselves to Him, this is what He is telling us we must do. He says we have to deny ourselves. Now again, what does Jesus mean when He says, I want you to follow my example, okay? What he means is he wants us to be like him. He wants us to do what he did. Now, Jesus denied himself. Remember Jesus when the devil offered him all the kingdoms of this world if he would bow down and worship him. Jesus considered these things as nothing compared to the glory that would be his. Jesus denied himself the world in order to possess the kingdom, okay? Jesus was telling Peter and his disciples, that's what you need to do too. Deny yourselves. And he's telling us the same thing. Secondly, he says we have to take up our crosses daily. You know, Jesus would soon take up his cross. And he would carry it to Golgotha where he would lay down his life for us. Paul tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, we also died with him. And what that means is we died to ourselves and we died to this world. And we were raised again for one purpose, and that is to follow Jesus. Jesus is the perfect example of the crucified life. He was, I mean, can you think of anything that Jesus did that, we, that he did out of self-interest in the world that wasn't directed towards the glory of his Father? 
Okay, the difference is not that we're not concerned about ourselves, but the question is, what are we, what are we concerned about? The world, or are we concerned about a heaven? The glory of this world, the things of this world, or the things of heaven? Well, Jesus was crucified to this world, and He lived for the glory of His Father, and the Lord is telling us we must do the same. Jesus tells us that if we hold on to our lives here, if we don't deny ourselves and pick up our crosses and follow Him, then we will lose our lives in the end, which means that we will have to face the consequences of our sins because we don't belong to Him. But if we give them up here to live for Him, then we will save our lives because it shows us the Spirit of God is working in us and we really do know Him and we really do love Him. Now, Jesus wants to enforce this, so He asks a very reasonable question. He says, which, which is better? To gain the whole world, if you could actually do that, and to enjoy it for the few years that you're actually going to be here, but then in the end lose your soul forever and suffer for eternity? Which is better, that or to give up your life here and to serve Him and to enjoy the rest of eternity with Him, enjoying the riches of heaven? We need to ask ourselves this morning, which of those two do we prefer? Now, if we want the latter, which is to give up our lives here that we might obtain eternal life, Jesus says we need to do a couple of things. Well, deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, follow Him. But that entails this as well. We must not be ashamed of Him. We must not be embarrassed by Him. We must not be ashamed of His words. Um, or, He says, He will be ashamed of us. If we are ashamed of Him here and of His words, He will be ashamed of us there. That doesn't mean He'll just look at us and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed of you, come on in. But He's going to say, you didn't follow me, go on out. Okay? We must love Him. We must own Him before others. So that is what He wants us to do. That is what we must do to inherit the heaven. Must not be uh, embarrassed by Him. We need to own Him. And then Jesus ends with this encouragement to His disciples. And this last verse is a verse that, um, that many have had a difficult time figuring where it actually goes and what it means. But I think what He was saying is, is this in this final verse, which I'll read in just a moment that the kingdom of heaven is worth it. It's worth making this sacrifice, and you are going to see this very soon. The kingdom is near, okay? It's actually present in the, in the person of the king, but its actual fulfillment in history was very near. He says in verse 27, but I say to you truthfully, there are some who are standing, excuse me, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Well, some understand this to mean what's going to happen next, which is the transfiguration. Jesus takes three of his disciples up to the mount, and he's transfigured before them. But the problem with that is Jesus did just say, some of you standing here will not taste death until this happens. When the transfiguration happens, they're all still alive. So that wouldn't make any sense. Others see it as the day of Pentecost, when the kingdom of heaven comes with power, Okay, Jesus has ascended. Ten days later, He sends the Holy Spirit. We see the power of the kingdom, and they experience it in their own lives. Well, He could be referring to that, but again, they're all still alive. Okay? So maybe Jesus has something a little further out. Maybe He's referring to when, after the disciples being empowered, preach the gospel through the whole Roman Empire, that the Lord brings a definitive end to the old covenant system in 70 AD when, when Jesus stretches out his arm through the armies of the Romans and he basically destroys the temple, okay? When that happened, only a few of the disciples were still alive. But there they see the definitive power of the kingdom of heaven. You know, the question is, why should we be willing to do what the Lord calls us to do? Well, we should because of all the promises that are here. We should because the Holy Spirit tells us it's worth it, because we, we know what's ahead of us, this glory of this kingdom, but we should also do it because we have seen the kingdom exert itself in the world. We have seen the power of the kingdom, and we should want to be a part of that because it gives glory to the Lord. Now, how have we seen that? Well, in the ways just described, the day of Pentecost, 
destruction of the Jews, uh, the, you know, the Jewish, basically the temple and Jerusalem and the putting away of the old covenant uh, people of God in order to embrace a people that is made up of believing Jews and Gentiles. Uh, we've seen that. We've seen many revivals as the Lord breaks through from time to time in history. There's been, of course, the first and second great awakenings. and There's been other revivals like the Reformation. We've seen the power of God in history. We have the testimonies of so many people who have gone before us, people whose biographies and writings are in our library back there to encourage us that the sacrifice is worth it. We have the testimony of those in the Scriptures to tell us that it's worth whatever we have to pay, that it's worth not only to suffer and die for the Lord once in order to obtain the kingdom, but it's really worth having to suffer that 10,000 times or however many times we have to do it to enter into heaven. The Lord wants us to be convinced of the fact that it is that we might be willing to pay this price, be willing to deny ourselves, to pick up our crosses and to follow the Lord Jesus, to own Him and not be ashamed of Him in life. Jesus gave us the example. He stood up for us again. He was not ashamed to, to own His Father before men and to suffer and die on His behalf. And He tells us, we need to be willing to do the same thing, and we need to be willing to follow Him even to death. But this is exactly what we are willing to do because He has given us the Spirit of God. We need to be convinced that it is. And I think that if we know the Lord, we know that it is worth it. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us to... Um, be able to uh, accept what the Lord is saying, understand what the Lord is saying, and be able to apply this to our lives so that it, it really does make a difference in the way we conduct ourselves. We need to receive this by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let, let's pray.